Should we start then? Can we switch off the fans? Maybe by uh, conducting some kind of surveys, and then you collect a lot of data. 
and once you collect the data, you will make the data entry into some kind of a system, some software, some kind of an ERP system. And then after you compile all the data, you do the data analysis. That's what we call it the research methodology. And this data analysis, as far as the quantitative data, means the data in the form of figures and lot of numbers, that is called as the quantitative data. It may be in the form of number of people, then different questions which you formulate. So there are hundred questions. So every people, uh, every person will be giving different answers to the question. So you input all that data in the form of figures only. I am not talking about the, the answers which are given in the interview. So if I ask you, how would you rate my lecture or my class on the scale of one to ten? One is very unexpected, very very bad, very poor, worst, and ten excellent, outstanding. So on the scale, every one of you will rate me in a different way according to your uh, maybe I would say ability to understand, ability to grasp, or maybe your uh, liking towards my class. So I am asking you to rate me from one to ten. Every one of you will not rate ten, or every one of you will not even rate one. Maybe somewhere in between you will rate. Some of you will rate five, some of you will rate six, some of you will rate eight, nine, ten. That depends upon your impression about this particular lecture. I am just giving you a very long example for you to understand. Likewise, if I collect the data from all of you, I am uh, dealing with a similar kind of subject in uh, some other universities in Pune, MIT, WPU, I go, then SPPU, I reach, then I am coming here, for, which is belonging to Mumbai University. So I will collect the analysis, uh, I will collect the data about satisfaction of my class, my lectures, to all the PGDM students. Like I go to Symbiosis also. So I collect all the data. And then I input that data into the system. Now I got all the figures. I might have uh, asked you to rate my presentation, my classes based on quality of PPT, quality of videos, then my verbal language, my attire. So I may have some 10, 15 parameters which will ultimately end up in an Excel sheet with a lot of figures in it. So what do I do? I uh, take the data, I input into the system called as SPSS. You might have heard of it. That is a software which will analyze the data and it will give me some kind of output, some kind of results. Based on the results, I will be taking certain decisions. For example, if I uh, get a very negative feedback as far as my speaking is concerned, say uh, I get uh, as far as my uh, pronunciation words, speed of talking is concerned, supposing I get somewhere between 2 and 3, means I have to highlight and I have to take more care about my pronunciation, my way of uh, saying the sentences, maybe speed of speaking, etc. So that data will tell me after analysis what improvisation are required to be done in me as an individual. All seven individuals, what I am trying to tell you is the one who will input that data into the system, that person's soul is also equally important. If we input some wrong figures, then the results are going to be wrong. So therefore, every individual who is engaging himself or herself in business activity. Now, business activity can be anything. It, it starts right from, I always give the example of the watchman who will keep a record of who is coming in, who is going out. He will, uh, whenever you go to any company, you are supposed to write your name, then uh, maybe whom do you want to visit, how have you come from, where have you come, what is your vehicle number, etc. Et you might have to give your identity card. You will have to go and meet that uh, concern officer, get his signature after you meet him and give that check to that person back. So in case, suppose it during your tenure, you are within the campus and some theft happens in the company. So you might be inquired, you might be interrogated. Who is responsible for getting this particular fact to the notice of the management? It is that watchman who is responsible to get that data collected properly and given it to the management. So management will go through again uh, the CCTV footage and they will find out you are the one who came in and while going out you put certain things in your pocket and you went out. Right? So my point is, even the workman or the gatekeeper or the watchman also becomes the individual who is engaged in a business activity. That may be probably the lower most player which any organization can have. Right from there, till CEO, board of directors, senior managers, asset level managers, middle level managers, engineers, workers, all the people who are concerned with some or the other activity are said to be individuals engaged in business activity of that particular company. So whatever happens in the company, you are directly or indirectly responsible for that happening in the company. Directly or indirectly. Indirectly is more. So the moral principles, policies, values that govern the way businesses and individuals engage in a business activity.
So business is in all the business houses, all companies, all manufacturing unit, all industries, all service sectors, which is one of the biggest sectors in a country like India. Which, which we are Indians are not much known for the manufacturing sector, but now it was at one point of time. Now the service industries are growing up in India more as compared to the manufacturing industry. So whether it is service industry or manufacturing industry, whatever may be the type, it is the kind of business activity at the end of the day. Because service industry is also there to make money. Rather, they have made they can make a lot of money out of the abstract things which cannot be shown to the people. Say for example, if you go to a restaurant, if you go to a hotel, not restaurant. Hotel to stay. Now, if you, if I ask you, what have you got out of that hotel? What is the outcome? What you received from that hotel? Ideally, nothing. But what you received is a service. So, the more you go to the star hotel, the service cost will increase. The room size probably will remain the same, but the facility provided in the room, the kind of services which are provided to you, the modesty which is maintained, the, the way you are welcomed, the way you are being treated. All that matters a lot as far as the success of this organization is concerned. So therefore, most of the star hotels have got their branches across the world and they are famous, known as a chain of hotels, chain of star hotels. It's only again an example of a business activity in a service area. Like insurance companies, then your financial service companies, then uh, banks, hospital aid sector, hospitals even for that matter, education institutions. These are all service providing ultimately at the end of the day businesses. Though educational institutions run under the trust and this trust are supposed to be not having any kind of profit, not generating any kind of profit. So these are the days when the society like the Indian society or there are a few others in Pune and Mumbai who started education as a philanthropic activity. But now it has become a business. So if you could see there are many private players, private universities have come up. Earlier there used to be only state universities or government universities, central government universities. But nowadays there are private universities, there are deep universities because education also is or has become a money making business. There was a sentence, I want to name the name of the person who has said this sentence. It was a big heading in one of the newspapers that we have not started education for education but for making money. Because all said and done, all the things put together, even education institution, educational bodies, philanthropic bodies, even NGOs are also supposed to maintain their balance sheet. And what are the parts of balance sheet for most people? What are the two parts of balance sheet? Two sides of the balance sheet. Yes, it's yes. And there is another statement which we uh, you call it as profit and loss of income. Or income and expenditure statement. In profit and loss, you will come to know whether the company is running into profit or loss. So whether it is a trust, trust is also supposed to maintain the balance sheet where the whether the trust is in deficit or whether the trust is surplus that should be mentioned. Point is even if it is an NGO, it is having or it is carrying out certain kind of monetary transactions and which may be under some ATG or some kind of government schemes. So point here is that even if it is an education institution or a philanthropic organization, they have to do or they could be classified under some kind of activity, I want to say business activity. Because businesses are mainly aimed to make profits, whereas NGOs and philanthropic uh, organizations, they don't make profit. Rather, their intention is not to make profit. Most of the NGOs, they get a lot of donations from the people. So they always have a lot, lot, lot of money pending with them. But then that doesn't mean that is their intention to make money. There is one NGO in Pune, uh, which is a old age home. So if you go to them for giving some kind of donation in the in the kind form, not in the monetary form. So you might give them uh, 200 or 2 quintals of rice or maybe 1 quintal of uh, uh, wheat, something like that. They will say, no, no, please don't give us. We already have got a lot of such things lying in our inventory, which is likely to go waste if we don't use it. So if you want to give, you can give us money. Because that might be helpful in building infrastructure, giving more better medical facilities to the old age home people. So that will help us. But giving every time the donation in the form of grains or in the form of some food items will be very much not that much helpful because old age people, anyways, they don't eat much. You know, as you grow old, your appetite becomes weak and then you start eating less and less. That considering that particular medical fact, they said, no, no, please don't give us any kind of food items. If you want to give, this is the account number, you deposit the amount in uh, our bank account. Of course, all the things are very well documented and accounted for, 
but again that is still not a business but the people who are working there those who follow some kind of principles and policies the people who work for NGOs they do not take any kind of salaries they do not take any benefit out of it they do not enjoy the profits they may not be having any kind of shares which are taken out of the profit or out of the money which has been deposited in the NGO's account so their sole intention is to help the society to help the uh, community to help, uh, to help the elderly or village people or maybe the orphanage home there are many in the most of places in Pune and Mumbai there are many orphanage homes available where a small child is born and he or she doesn't know who is his mother or father that child is left to the orphanage or he doesn't have any kind of uh, know-how of their parents so there are many people who help such kind of philanthropic activities in that case their individuals is philosophy principles and values matter not all of us may be interested in uh, engaging ourselves in such kind of an activity where you may not be interested in helping or meeting uh, going to the old age uh, home people and then meeting them having or uh, spending your entire day with them you may not be interested in going to the orphanage and helping those students maybe you may not be interested in paying their fees etc that is totally individual choice but if you are ready to work for those kind of cause then you are an individual who is engaged in that kind of philanthropic activity which itself is based on some kind of values or some kind of principle so the purpose of NGOs, purpose of philanthropic activities, the purpose of no profit, no loss kind of organizations is basically to serve the society without any intention of making money. Whereas purpose of all other businesses, barring the example, uh, example which I have given, purpose of every business is to make money and to make profit. Right? So when you are making profit, you cannot be making the profits by unethical or immoral ways. That has to be following certain value systems. So whether you are a business started by your own, grown to entrepreneurship firm, grown to private limited, maybe going to the stock exchange, doesn't matter. But still you are into the business and you are there to make money. So whether you are a business of any kind or individual involved in some kind of business, you are supposed to follow certain principles, policies, values. And those values, principles, we call as business ethics because those are related to business. Okay, all the businesses, uh, those, are, those who are making profits, also we have to follow that. These are all few principles, a small example figure in the internet. So it is in a set of rules or principles that organization should follow. We also call this business ethics as business ethos. Ethos word we have learnt in model number one. So for Indians, Ramayana, Mahabharata, etc., those are called as ethos. But then those are the value systems which Indians are expected to follow, you being an Indian. If you go to uh, some uh, Eastern side or European countries, then you, you may have to follow Christianism. If you go to more to the Muslim countries, you might have to follow the Islamism. Islamism. So the kind of religion, kind of ism which is prevalent in that country, that you have to follow. So therefore we call it as a national ethos. So Indian business is all those examples which I have given in the last slide before the break. That means one Mahabharat, uh, then uh, Bhagavad Gita, Vedas, Puranas, Kautila, Rasa Shastra. These, these are all born up in India. Whereas Quran, uh, then Granthas, Granthas Sahib is again you know, not born in India. Related to Sikh and, Krishna, Sikh and Punjabi. Then uh, Quran is not born in India, it is not generated in India. Then Bible is not generated in India, it is in Jerusalem. You might have heard it here. So different, so those are the things which are born or maybe taken birth in those countries. So those country people follow those particular scriptures or that particular literature. So that is called as that country's ethos. When we are talking about business ethics followed by a company with a set of rules which becomes a code of conduct called as business ethos. Now ethos means certain standards which that company follows. So I will make my standards which are of course in line with what are rules regulations said by the government, what components I am supposed to do, what all uh, environmental norms my company is supposed to follow. So I will devise policies, I will design rules and regulations for, for my company which will suit for my company's culture to follow later in the entire year. Again here I would like you to recollect the Narayan Murthy statement in module number one where he says that we started this company to gain respect from our stakeholders, that was the statement. 
rest of businesses came up, then it has become MNC, now it is present in more than 100 countries, that is some different issues. But then they started the company with an intention to get the respect from the stakeholders, not to make money. Making money becomes a part of the business. The more you grow, you will automatically start making more and more business and more and more profit. If your business grows, doesn't mean that you are making profit. I am making the statement to all management students. If your business grows, does not mean that means that you are making profit. It may happen that you are going on expanding and expanding before a stage called as break-even point. How much? You have heard this particular concept. So you want to improvise your business, go, you want to go places, you want to go global. So you are putting in money, maybe drawing the loans from nationalized banks and then you are improvising the business. But that doesn't mean that you are making profit. You may be making losses or you may be having deficits and slowly and slowly, year by year, you will start increasing your profit and then you will reach to the place what we call as a VEP. And then after that, or the onwards, then you will start making profits. Getting that point? So with reference to that, you need to have or you need to design a standard code of conduct for your own company which will decide what kind of culture you want to develop, you want to inculcate. I can give you a very simple example of your schools and colleges. You can recollect the school days, going back to your school time, where whichever school you might have attended. You might remember your graduation college, whichever you might have attended. You can just think about the kind of rules, regulation, discipline which your school or your college used to follow. Maybe uh, this institution is following rules, regulations. So those are nothing but a way going towards setting certain standard norms for a particular organization. Why I've given you the example of school and college? Because you can imagine. Because when I say school, I went back to my school where my school was very strict. We never used to have air conditions, we never used to have benches, we used to sit with legs folded on the floor. And if, <laughs> if we, we used to be late just by one minute, there used to be first ringing bell at 7.50, second bell used to be at 7.25 and third was at 7.30 in the morning. So anyhow, we were supposed to be seated in the class before 7.25. Our headmaster used to stand right at the main entrance, like where is your main entrance gate, gate number 3. So he used to stand there with a long stick in his hand and if anybody is late after 7.25, dot on 7.25, even if anybody is trying to rush into the college, school gate, he used to stop them and he used to stand all of them in a row for next 5 minutes, 7.25 to 7.30. If somebody is come, coming late after 7.30, then he added. You have to face the music for the entire day. So from 7.25 to 7.30, 5 minutes late, we have to walk in. Every time he used to have that big stick, cane stick, and he used to hit on our hands. We still remember. I had been a victim only once, of course. I was only always on time. But then that has made me to go back to my school days. You might go back to your school days and just find out what kind of culture your school has. So who has decided that? That school has decided that we want to develop this kind of a culture. There are some schools in uh, many places, St. George's, then uh, Loyola. So these are the big groups. If you go to Pachgani, there are many such schools available who have got set their norms or who have got set their standards. That is nothing but the business culture. Though we are not considering education as a sector or education as a business house, still they set a culture. So when you go to a particular school, why do you want to have education taken from the XYZ school? Why, uh, don't, why most of the management students want to take their education in IIMs? Because there is a set culture for these all organizations. And that culture is still continue to maintain that culture with yourself. So for setting that culture, you have to have some sort of standard. For setting that culture, you have to have some standard methodology, standard practices to be followed. And then only you will be able to set that culture. So business ethics are all the good principles that an organization should follow. How an organization will follow? Suppose I decide that this entire institution should be disciplined. So how this room will follow discipline? How this uh, projector will follow the discipline? How this PC will follow the discipline? It won't. Are you getting what I am trying to ask you? So when I am wanting the organization to follow the discipline, it is the building infrastructure to not follow the discipline. Right? It is the people who are in that building in that organization they follow. So when I say 
the principles, rules, organization should follow means the people of the organization should follow. Getting that point? So when I want to set the culture, when I want to set the standards, I should be setting the standards for the people. All the standards are for the people. Unless you are thinking about a robotics or automated machine, which uh, has to start on the on its own, it also doesn't happen. This air conditioner has got a setting. You know, they call it the 12 hour or 24 hour setting. If your classes are from 9 o'clock in the morning till say 6 o'clock in the evening, I can set it to the uh, set the temperature and timing to this AC. That at 8 30 it will automatically get switched on half an hour before you come in, so that once you come in, this entire place is quite cool and it will get switched off at 5 30. So that 6 o'clock when you leave, it is totally shut down. But still, that kind of automation, I will require some human being to control it. Okay, to set that temperature, to set that timing, next day it might change. Somehow, suppose you have got holidays on Saturdays and Sundays, it may not be required. Otherwise, it will be unnecessary running for the whole day without being anybody inside. What I am trying to tell you is that machine, infrastructure, building, norms, rules, regulations are not for them. Those are only for the human beings and human beings are the ones who will be setting the culture and not the machinery. We do have, we do talk about infrastructure. As I have given you the example of uh, that one university in Pune, MIT, World Peace University, which is one of the best universities I've done today. So if you go there, infrastructure is of course excellent. You don't get a feeling that we are in India. No, that is a typical notion we have. We, we are walking on some street which is very exclusively maintained, very clean. Then we always have a this thing. I say, Lagni Rana in India. Why? Because we always have got a negative impression of our country in our brains. Itna clean hai, to apne India mein nahi sakta. Itna achha hai India mein nahi sakta. Why? Because our brain has been directed in that way. Right? When we go to the foreign countries, we see, see, this kind of infrastructure we should have to have in India. So the kind of bridges which are constructed in Mumbai, those are excellent bridges. Very rare countries have got those kind of bridges. But then we don't see like that. But whenever something negative we see, we'll say. Why? Because that is our brain and dream. If something which is good, it is always it always comes from foreign country. Something which is extraordinary, it is always coming from European or Western country. It's not necessary. I have shown you in the last slide of module 2. All the management principles, philosophies, all management learning, leadership learnings have born in India only. But then we look up towards the western countries, whatever is coming from their side, that is something which is good. All the western philosophies, all the western theories which we are learning in management, those were not actually been invented by them, it is proven. Right? But then we have got that mind strained in such a way that whatever happens good is not from India. It is from some western countries. That, that kind of impression we have got about that. But then, uh, summary of this is that whatever rules, principles your organization is supposed to follow, code of conduct, the organization is supposed to or expected to follow while doing the businesses, that is called as business ethics or ethics is per se called as all these codes of conduct. So code of conduct is set of rules that are considered binding by the people working in the organization. All rules, regulations, so when you get selected in a company, uh, there is something called as the induction which happens to you. So you'll be inducted. And this induction varies from company to company from any anywhere between two hours or maybe one full day to seven days, fifteen days also in some of the companies. So this induction will be telling you or it is intended to tell you what kind of culture our organization follows. So they will tell you the different names of different departmental heads, you will be taken to the different departmental heads, introduced to them. Then all those people whom you are likely to have dealings with, as a part of your designation, you will be introduced to all of them. Uh, taking uh, you being taken by somebody, some representative individually, personally to a different department, different people getting introduced. Then you will be asked to sit on a machine or a PC. You will be told that this is the folder. You open each and every folder, each and every file in it, and then you read it. If you have got any questions, you can ask to the uh, senior head HR. So you may note down some questions. So there they are trying to tell you policies, code of conduct, different kind of practices which are being followed by the organization. You are expected to know it very properly. So that you fit yourself in that particular culture. You cannot expect the company to change the company policies as you want to function. It is the other way around. 
you will have to adapt to the system you will have to accept the system which the company is following so you need to know what kind of policies do they have what are the leave policies what are the policies of payment what kind of extra benefits you will be getting as a part of your designation what kind of perks you will be getting uh, what are, i have given you an example of traveling abroad so for different designation different levels of the designation the traveling abroad and the kind of allowances which you get those are different those will keep on varying that will depend upon the designation so you need to identify the designation you are fitting in and what are going to be my facilities provided to you so if at all any trouble comes any problem comes you can always refer to that and all these documents what we call as the induction document are available on a central server so if you cannot go through those documents within a given uh, amount of time you can always refer to that document anywhere any time you want to refer to that again what i am trying to tell you by this big example is every organization will set certain rules set certain codes of conduct set certain bylaws set the way you should be in that company even wearing an i card most of the companies are making it compulsory few of the companies they do have uniform few of the companies they want you to put their logo here they will give you logo and they will it is mandatory to put their logo whenever you are inside some of the companies will say that whenever you are out of the campus that time also you will have to put their logo you may be doing some of the rotary club thing so wherever they go in any function they will have that rotary club logo here why because being associated affiliated with rotary club is a pride for me so whenever i am there in the society i will be carrying the emblem with me as a rotary club there is one organization in pune which all of us know all of you know called as nda what is that <laughs> national defense second so all the students who take admission there they have got holidays only on sundays they come to deccan gym khana or ferguson college which are one of the happening streets in pune just like the other chopatis in mumbai so that is ferguson college is one of such happening place in pune so they do come to enjoy their weekend on sundays on sundays also they will be wearing their uniforms and they are mandatorily be wearing their uniforms even if they are coming for enjoyment so do you want to go a beach wearing uniform blazer and tie <laughs> but for that organization that is a set rule or code of conduct so immediately we can work out okay that student must be very brilliant because getting admission to india is not so easy so by just presence of that person even on sunday outing day weekend day or whatever you call it even in informal time also the people are very free why because those are the set rule or code of conduct that particular organization is following so as i was telling you the rules regulations are for the people not for chairs and benches and furniture and the building so it is the uh, code of conduct set rules that the people working in that organization people working most important word is people Businesses should have now while setting code of conduct, you should have to have balance between needs of stakeholders and their desire to make progress. I'll give you an example of uh, school and college again because all of you will be able to understand. Now you have about how many subjects in this semester? Twelve subjects. Is it easy or taxing to study twelve subjects? Not taxing. Easy. So I'll ask them to add three more. <laughs> so 12 subjects studying in 3 months time it is quite difficult isn't it i am not sure whatever i have been talking to you for you know it module number 1 module number 2 if i ask you some of the concept to explain i am not sure how many of you are able to explain definitely not you are understanding it 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 is very much easy when i am telling you to understand but then when it comes to reproducing it is very much difficult therefore i have come out with a simple option of keeping open media on the other side and you answer so that you should be at least able to correlate once you are able to correlate that correlation fix in your brain so that's the reason why i try to give you more examples fourth and fifth theory is all examples model number 4 and 5 no theory at all all examples i'll be showing you a lot of videos so i need this system to be done properly for unit number 4 and 5 all examples of companies videos of companies the cases of the companies so that you will actually understand what do i mean by all these three models which i have been teaching to you so we are talking about businesses should have a balance between shareholders and stakeholders in profit so i have given you example of a uh, management institute for for the sake of example so you are overburdened with 12 subjects 
each subject is expected to have at least three concurrent assignments. CCE is what we call, or I don't know what you call it. Assignments, what do you call it? Assignments. So three assignments for each subject. So 12 into 3, 36 assignments. Again, this is to be done in only 90 days. So after every alternate days or alternate two days, you have some of the other assignments. There are some other events, activities happening in the institute campus. There is some HR meet coming up, then there is some lecture in the afternoon, then I am coming to uh, grill you for uh, Thursdays and Saturdays, Thursdays and Fridays, so you have to attend that for 6 hours, right? So there are a lot of activities, your placement is also coming up, placement training will be given separately, attendance is mandatory for all. So don't you think that you are overburdened on your brains, which you probably never had done in your uh, college days? No, college days are very much happy days between 12th standard and your post graduation. That's why only 4% people go for post graduation. Because they enjoy for all the 3 years, they don't want to take education ahead. <laughs> so 12, 10th, 10th and 12th are very serious days in your life. Because <laughs> that is going to make the entire career graph. And then 3 years for graduation are only for enjoyment. So you become that cultured person. And all of a sudden, I am asking you to come out of that enjoyment environment and asking you to become serious for next two years, which is a very difficult task for you people. So maintaining balance, what do I do? What the colleges will do? We will take you on some excursion, we will take you on some trip, we will ask you, we will give you some gracious party, then we will give you, or maybe you will have to give a senior friend of party, whatever. So you enjoy your lot of parties, then Dasera celebration, Diwali celebration, what is this done? We are trying to maintain the balance between stakeholders, means you, you people are stakeholders and profits I am not talking about. So maintain the balance between your studies and between your enjoyment. Both the things are equally required. We need to uh, we need to recreate ourselves. That recreation is required for every individual human being. We call it as a hedonism or we call it as an enjoyment seeking. It is required by all of us. If you are too much overburdened with the studies, what do you do? Suppose you are studying, the exam is there next day and now you say, okay, enough of study today, what do you do? Hmm? Everyone may be doing something different. Ultimate aim is same, so what do you do? This is a question to all. You can tell your own example or own what you do as an individual. Rest your statement. So, one of the most recreation uh, habit most of the people have got. So, what do you do? 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 Socializing, you meet people, have party, go to the restaurant, right? Why this is needed? Answer is here. Why this is needed? The answer is here. Balance. You have to maintain the balance. At, at present, it is the balance between studies and your recreation activities. Only. You, you cannot enjoy all the time. Because we have to appear for exams. Then uh, tomorrow day after, I will have the test of my module. So you cannot only enjoy. So you have to study also. This is easy still. Suppose you get too much rid of studying, you will say, do. Jada jada kya hoa backlog right? They will get next semester. But in workplaces, you cannot do that. Yeah. Like, kal aapka, uh, reporting is, you are supposed to make some kind of a presentation in front of your seniors. Can you say like that? Hai, kal nahi to next semester mein de de. So there you will have a lot of work pressure and therefore, most of the companies, they will give you a lot of recreation facilities. You can watch the videos of Microsoft and Google and all those kind of top-notch companies. The kind of facilities which they provide to the employees is only mainly for the purpose of making their stakeholders to have the balance between their work and the company doesn't go away from making the profits. No businesses will work from making losses or not making profits. So the final intention is to make the profit. So we have seen in one of the slides in model 2, if employees are happy, employees are engaged, then they, will, they are likely to generate more profits. And it is the organization's responsibility at the end of the day to strike a balance between work and what we call as a life. So there is a lot of importance given 
I am one of such trainers to the companies where I do a training on work-life balance or stress management. Lot of companies are doing stress management training for people like you who join industries. Why? Because you need to strike a balance between work, work life and personal life. How much work life do you have and how much personal life do you have? Work life is 8 hours working, 1 hour coming and 1 hour going, say 10 hours of that. When you come home, 24 minus 10, 14 hours on your hand, how much hours you sleep? Minimum 6 hours, 6 to 8, 6 hours per day on average. 7 hours. Ideally, you should sleep for 8 hours. Yeah. Then we don't have that much time. So, 6 to 7, considering an average of 7, you have only 7 hours in your hand. Divided into 2 parts, 3 and a half hours in the morning, 3 and a half hours in the evening. What do you do during your 3 and a half hours? Silence, please, on that corner. This won't look good in my video later. <laughs> okay. So, 3 and a half hours is in, in your hand to give to your family members. 3 and a half hours in the morning, 3 and a half hours in the evening. Question is, how much of 3 and a half hours you give to your family members? Honestly. Maximum half an hour, maybe during the time of dinner. Lunch to watch is not possible. So during the time of dinner, you might be having the dinner together for half an hour. Remaining 3 hours, 2 hours you are on WhatsApp and 1 hour on some kind of exercise which you have been giving them. Okay. So your personal life, you are giving only maximum effectively 2 hours in a day. And work life, 18 hours. Some people will take the uh, workplaces, activities also to home. Which file like is there, which laptop, every every company will give you the first thing is give you the laptop. And then you will tell proudly to your family members, laptop be a company. You the end and you should be employable 24 hours. <laughs> so you will get a call from your boss vocal, I mean she discussed, yeah, mail it to me before 12 o'clock night. So again you are at work, home also you are working. So maintaining the balance between the two things is very difficult. Therefore the concept of Saturday, Sunday, holiday, five days working has come that at least two days you should be given to your family members. There is a research going on, fortunately in universities, that that four days week they are, they are experimenting on. So three days you will be having holidays for your family and four days you will be giving only for the work. Why? Again, all said and done, I am only talking about maintaining the balance. And who should be helping you to maintain the balance? It is the companies who should have to have those kind of policies which will make you to maintain your work life balance. I have told you, I go to the companies to give training on work life balance. My training is for 7 days. How do you maintain work life balance? But then how do you actually maintain that depends on you. I might be telling you many different ways to do that. But it actually varies from person to person. So it is a company who will call the people to give training on work life balance, to give training on stress management, to give uh, training on employee engagement, then uh, being oneness with the company, a lot of training will be given to you from the point of view of your involvement with the company. Ultimately what they want, they want you to balance your personal life as well as balance your work life. Ideally. But in reality, they want you to only work for the company. That training they will give you as a, for the sake of training because they have got a budget allocated for that, they will do it. Next day morning they will say, ka mujhe mat batao, ye jo karne karna hai, karo. So where is the balance made? So possibly maintaining the balance has got some relationship with that SQ which I mentioned earlier in the morning. Spiritual quotient. How do you maintain the balance is here? Whatever circumstances come to you, you should be able to keeping yourself balanced in that situation. Means not getting heavy, not getting to the extremes, not getting too much angry, not getting frustrated, not getting too much happy, not getting too much sad. You should have to have a proper balance between the two, which is very difficult. And again, who is responsible for that? It is the business ethics, code of conduct, the culture, and uh, the businesses who are actually devising these strategies to decide a particular culture. So they will be at the end of the day deciding how do you balance for the company. So business is studying how to deal with corporate governance. This is going corporate culture and corporate social responsibility. We will start from this side. CSR we have talked about in the morning. It is a social activity which every organization carry out for the benefit of the society. 
this is made india is the first government in the world who has made social activities compulsory though we call it as a corporate social responsibility i make a full form of this is a compulsory social responsibility because unless and until the government has made the social activities compulsory the corporates or the corporations will never used to do it so government has made a law or it has they have included in a companies act that you will have to compulsory to do some kind of social work if you are fitting this particular xyz criteria of the turnover the profit and uh, the total holdings of the company so if you are fitting in that criteria you will have to compulsory be doing some kind of social work now what kind of social work you should do there is a schedule given in the act so these are the 10 activities if you are doing something out of this in activity then it is supposed to be a csr this is done by the uh, from the point of view business ethics thought over by the government so you have to do the csr activities then you have to maintain the corporate culture as spoken a lot then whistle blowing whistle blowing means if i am seeing that somewhere something wrong is happening and i tell to my top authorities that is called the whistle blowing what happens whistle blowing the word has come from traffic you might have seen if somebody is uh, violating the rule of a traffic what the traffic police does he blows a whistle very harshly so that that person will come to that he is doing some kind of a mistake or he is doing something wrong so if you happen to see something against the policy or something which is not supposed to happen in the company premises happening then you are the one who should be communicating to the management in such cases if the person who is actually doing it he will come to the rear report to the management so will he behave properly with you definitely so he will in in such cases how the organization deal with such kind of whistle blowing cases if somebody reports negativity about some xyz person that xyz person is likely to have worse relationship with the person who was reported but management has come to know that something negative has happened in this particular company so what actions do they take how they try to keep the person who is blowing the whistle safe and what are the policies about that that comes under business ethics because ideally no unethical practice should happen in the premises of the organization and i know that i am a very ethical person i see somebody who is doing unethical work i get disturbed i communicate to the management he comes to know that i am the victim rather i am the person who is communicating to the management he will start behaving odd with me which i don't want but i want such kind of practice to be curbed so what i do i try to find out or maybe organization will try to devise certain kind of strategies that in case of people like me who would report such kind of negative activities happening in the company premises which are against the policies of the company against rules of the regulation of the company against the culture of the company then i should be protected and that person should be punished or maybe some action should be taken against him maybe stopping a promotion stopping increment maybe removing or transferring that person but directly not taking an action of removing that person which will ultimately end up following of the culture of the organization and that's what this particular lies in this is going in corporate governance is all talking about the transparency the only single word with which corporate governance could be explained is transparency whatever you do all the things should be transparent which doesn't actually happen in most of the world so all the uh, and that typically is expected to happen with uh, i mentioned in the morning session typically the stock listed companies they have to have a very strong corporate governance so very rules regulations very strictly followed and there is no way out and escaping from any of so this is these are all those governance practices code of conduct rules regulations etc so these are all few words which we have already been hearing in module number 1 and module number 2 integrity loyalty honesty at individual level as well as the group level team level and in the sphere fairness and leadership few more listed right over already there avoiding conflicts is uh, having relationship with the peace value which is so if i have got conflicts i have got um, not getting well with the people i don't agree with somebody then i like to have conflicts conflicts in simple words uh, is a quarrel but which may be for the cause of some positive interaction so conflicts are to define conflict in a very proper way it is the disagreement between the two people so if i am looking towards a 
particular point from my side, I am correct. If somebody is looking from the other side, he is also correct. So they give an example of a car which is painted. The car went went with an accident, and uh, the witnesses were interviewed. And the witness was asked, "What was the color of the car?" So the witness said it was white. And there was another witness. He said it was black. The actual witness said the car was painted half black on one side and half white on the other side. So whatever the car I saw from this side, I saw it white. The other witness saw it from the other side. He saw it black. Both were wrong and both were correct at the same time. Isn't it? According to the white uh, car colored car person, he will say that he is wrong. He will say he is wrong because he he has seen from the car from that side. He has seen the car from this side. So both are correct. So conflict is looking at a point from your own viewpoint, which may be correct from both the points of view. So I may be correct, the other person might be correct, but we have to find out a via medium. And that is what conflict is. So conflict resolution. There are techniques you will learn it in later. Technically or theoretical, so how do you relate the resolve of conflict? But actually, the scientific method in reality doesn't work. If some suppose two people are there who are coming to you, you are an HR manager, and there two people come to you with a complaint against each other. So you will ask them, okay, you give us a writing statement, then you will send him, okay, you give us a show cause that he has given a complaint against you. You tell us what is the reason. He will again give it in writing. Then you will again give it in writing to the other person. He is showing saying, uh, saying like this against you. So what is the opinion? You give it, give it to me in writing. This is the standard procedure which they will follow. You give it to me in writing. If uh, I have to take the decision, I have to take it within seven days. If I don't take the decision within seven days, you can go to my boss, complaining me and then complaining the other person. So we cannot all the time finalize or we cannot all the time work on the standard procedures. So if two people come to me and I am an HR manager talking about they against each other, I will ask them verbally. Okay, you tell me what is happening. You tell me what is happening. He is saying like this. He is saying like this. Who is correct? What is that authenticated document you have? Or any proof that he has behaved like that? So we at the times may not actually follow the standard procedures. We at times we may not have to go by rules and regulations, but by the way by which we can possibly avoid further consequences of going to the standard procedure of conflicts. Otherwise, there is a standard procedure which you will learn in the syllabus of some other subject. Conflict resolution process. There is a process. But in reality, that doesn't work. So standard-wise or ethically, I should have to have a, uh, I won't say policy, but such kind of environment or a culture created where the conflicts do not arise at all. And everybody is clear about what he is supposed to do. And if at all the conflict arises, as I said, both the parties are correct. Talking about quarrel, they say that if two people are fighting, there is there are three sides of that fight. One is one person's fight side, second is second person's side, and third is right right side. Understand that two people are fighting, this person's side, second person's side, and right side. If they are fighting, none of them is right. With the conflict, it doesn't happen. Everybody might be correct at several places, as I told you, white car or black car. They are looking the same issue from different perspective, from different angle. So there should not be any kind of confusion. I shouldn't have painted that car like that. So somebody should look from one side black and other side he will look at the car as white. So I will have one same color to the car. So the conflict will not arise. Why the conflict is arising and why it was correct because everybody was seeing from his own viewpoint. So whenever conflicts arise in the organization, everybody is correct. You will have to find out who is more correct amongst them and what is the real issue of the decision. And then if you take an action in that, no problems or no such kind of conflicts will be arising. So avoiding conflict is one of the business issues in the industry areas. You tell me when it's too early, I'm supposed to talk. Honestly, we have seen in model one and two. Care and respect. You should always care and respect all your colleagues, your seniors, your superiors, your subordinates, your colleagues, etc. Everyone. Compliance. I have spoken about. Compliance is all government rules, regulations to be followed and complied. And I'll give you a simple example of filing your income tax return. Though you might not have filed it till now, when you will start working, you will have to file an income tax return. When is it to be filed? Anyone knows? When an idea is to be filed? Income tax return. Not in March. July. When do you file it? July. Usually in the month of July end is the month of filing income tax return. 
for a reason by the march end that is what we call as the financial year ending all the companies will be ready with their balance sheet all income expenditure statement profit loss statement etc so out of that they will give you something called as the form 16 the amount of income salary that they pay along with everything is included in how much amount of tax is paid to you uh, salary is paid to and tax is deducted and paid to the income tax department and then they will give that form 16 getting that form 16 will take somewhere around one to one and a half months some of the companies will give it to you somewhere in the month of april end or may you can file your return immediately but some companies where probably their cas are too busy or probably they don't go to proper cas they prepare the form 16 themselves etc for some other other difficulty by the end of june by the latest 15th of july you must get your form 16 once that page is on your hand you can go online and fill online letter within not less than half a minute by inputting that data and so you don't have to input that data manually because that data is already available on the government server how much amount of money is paid to you how much tax is deducted how much profit tax is deducted what are your savings toward your insurance and all other kind of uh, tax saving possibilities and then taxable income minus all those savings and then how much amount of tax is deducted by the company how much amount is paid that tax return you will have to do before july end very often our government extend that date by one month because it doesn't matter much and in the financial year so by the end of 31st august you will have to fill in your tax income tax return itr is a good itr this is a compliance compliance means you will have to do it you will have to file your income tax return by the end of let's assume july 31st if you don't do it what will happen what happens if we don't do if we don't fill in itr gst returns you need to fill every month you can fill it quarterly yes itr you need to fill once in a year if you don't fill itr what happens that's the question kya hota hai hi as far as you are not eligible to pay any tax government won't say anything but if you are likely to pay the tax tax also you paid because your tds is already deducted so the government is only receiving the money but if you don't fill in itr nothing much happens but then if the problem case comes then you might be interrogated why you are not filled up there are certain facilities listen to this carefully bank ventures there are the facilities by given by a government that if you are filling your tax returns regularly for 5 years there is an insurance cover most of the people do not know so you have to be very regular in filling up of itr which i am trying to give an example for compliance it is an individual compliance like this companies have to do lot of compliances if it is a restaurant or a food manufacturing company they have to do lot of compliances about food safety regulation act they are supposed to all the common things are there income tax is there gst is there profession tax is there uh, then tax deduction uh, number they are supposed to take so they have to fill those kind of returns also lot of compliances are there but if you are doing it on time then your organization is said to be very much ethical that's what it means by uh, business ethics and compliance relationship accountability is actually an individual value system or accountability is an individual characteristic nothing to do with accounts accountability is that you are ready to take the responsibility but if something goes wrong you will be the first who will take the initiative okay i will take this with this so i may be uh, given a chance to rectify so i will take the burden on my head that whatever plus minus thing happened that is because of me that's what is called as accountability so if you have been given the responsibility you are accountable for that means somebody can ask you why it is not like that so in accounts what do we do is we call it an audit accounts audit hota hai usually in the month of september and that is we call it as an internal audit and at the end of march we call it as an annual audit or external audit that is done by some external ca accountant what is the intention of audit why do we do it hmm? what do we do check the means in this case what do we exactly do it check the accounts hmm? to checking errors to check to check whether all the transactions you are doing are legal or not right so there is one case which has recently happened there were two uh, chartered accountants uh, appointed by a company and then the 
chartered accountant at the annual audit he asked that who is the chartered accountant in between you are getting this some internal uh, kind of audit done by his ca why is why is it happening why are you not coming to me for these audits the question was asked by the owner why are you asking this question now he said because i have seen this new ca which we have never seen here before the owner said that we are doing getting the internal audit done by the same ca for last 12 years haven't you noticed before Why can you can you ask this question right now? What I'm trying to tell you is about accountability. The other CA was putting some accountability on this internal auditor CA, which he has got the objection raised now, telling that who is this new CA because he was not aware that this CA uh, aware means he has never noticed that there is somebody else who is doing the internal audit. Getting that example is slightly complicated for non-commerce people to understand. But it is a part and parcel of the accountability. So at the end, when he is going to getting that annual auditing get, getting done for that particular firm, he should have checked the internal auditing done by somebody else. And then at the end of the day, he is the ultimate accountable person holding. That is why he is called as a chartered accountant. So accountability is the taking responsibility as well as taking the responsibility of making the good of the things which are going wrong. So audit is for that purpose. So chartered accountant will, if you happen to read the chartered accountant's report, chartered accountant will give the reports and they will they, he will uh, notify what are the things which are to be improved in the next year's annual statement. Right, producing certain kind of document. There are certain certain kind of invoices which are missing. There are certain payments which have not been approved first and they are made and then those were approved. So such kind of practices do keep on happening. And I'll show you some of the videos. Where because of the chartered accountant itself, the company has went to the dooms and the companies have closed. So it is only because of the basic principle of individual level for us accountability. Any responsibility given to me, if something goes wrong, I should be held responsible. That is what we call as accountability. Relevant information is one more problem which uh, you always keep on facing in the workplaces. You want to do some kind of data. You want to do. Give some kind of presentation, and you don't have the information available. You ask to some person that department will say, "Then you ask the next week, pura leave pe hai." You don't get that information. Therefore, in all the companies, they do have a centralized data saving system. So, if somebody is on leave, you should not wait for that person to come back, and then you will take the data from him. So, you can always access. Therefore, most of the companies will give you uh, the what we call as a business email. You cannot use Gmail for your workplaces, so they call it a business email or a formal email. So you will keep all your data, your emails, sent, received, everything will be stored in that. So even if in, in your absence, simply your departmental head or the authority person can access your email and get the data downloaded. It is for the purpose of making the relevant information available whenever it is not there. And there are many cases which I'll of course show you at the time of module four and five. Where information is required, but because of the organizational policies, that cannot be retained. So it could be possible. So, but organizations per se have to follow relevant information as one of the business ethics, and uh, for some kind of data and sharing and such. Law abiding, of course, all compliances and law abiding are related to each other. There are all different kind of laws. Typically, in the industries, they follow most of these uh, labor laws. Labor law means. Laws related to em uh, employee uh, this uh, trade union act, then employment act, then uh, gratuity act, provident fund act, workman's compensation act, minimum wages act. So there are provident fund act. There are different acts which are related to human beings. So all those acts every company has to follow. There are certain rules and regulations. How many number of employees? What is the turnover? So which kind of uh, act is applicable? Factories act is one of the biggest act. So all the norms are given. For uh, the companies to function, so if they will have to follow all the rules, regulation, even if it is not to be treated as ethics, but compliance is and law abiding becomes an ethics at the end of the day. Fulfilling commitments given to employees as well as the customers. So we have discussed a lot about employees and customer service. Fulfilling is a part and parcel of your ethics. How much time? Two, two, okay, last thing. Importance and benefit. Why do you want to have business with this? Because if you are going to be a ethical company, if you are an ethical company, you will definitely get the customers. 
data are known for that. So they, that's why here it's finding. Then if you are a ethical company, it will attract investors also. Therefore, your company like TCS can go at, out of India because there are foreign investors, foreign direct investments are ready to invest in a company which is ethical. So it will attract investors, it will attract good vendors. Vendors means the suppliers of the materials or services. Loyal and talented employees. So again, Tata is one of the such companies in India where uh, it is known for a long term employment. So once we join, uh, you will leave that company at the time of retirement. Doctors, uh, employees will also be at the time very much loyal. Retail loyal employees. So usually when you resign, uh, unless and until the company is ethical, they will not usually ask you to leave. Unless you are supposed to leave on some uh, kind of punishment ground. If you want to resign, they will definitely ask you why you are resigning. There is something called an exit interview. What they will try. They will try to find out if the company is going on some, around somewhere as far as the ethics are So if you are leaving for some kind of workplace treatment given to you, for some kind of workplace politics, for some kind of facilities which are not given to you, they would like to know why you are leaving. And after the exit interview also, there are some cases where the employee is retained. You will say, okay, these are your problems, we will be there to sort it out. And then the employee will not leave. So they want to retain, every company wants to retain the loyal employees. Of course, the resale will be very sound if you are very much equipped because everything is documented, very well maintained properly. Then cost reduction it will help because uh, when it comes to manufacturing industry, uh, getting the quality material, avoiding wastages, it will decrease the cost. Proper, you know, they call it as PPC, production planning and control. So that will reduce uh, cost to the extent. Then definitely you will have a competitive advantage as compared to other counterparts in the similar kind of business because you need the ethical company. Long term growth, cost reduction, distribution, limited resources, limited advantages of business. Nothing to explain as such for the over here. And of course, time problems. The more your company is ethical, the higher profits you will gain. This is the example that Tata has got these many outlets saying health care, health care, education, tools and travel, electronics, finance, fashion, lifestyle, FM, grocery. Tomorrow 9 o'clock we will start. Those people who are coming by train try to come by earlier. 